Today's video is a bit of a deep dive into how I keep a lean collection and how hopefully you can keep a lean collection as well, assuming you want to, of course. This is really a follow-up video to a video that I haven't done yet and I'm just changing the order on of the benefits of collecting versus playing and whether you should particularly care about one over the other or, you know, your habits there. But this video is, is skipping that entirely and going straight to let's pretend you're someone who has too many board games and let's pretend that's something you actually don't want. Let's pretend that you actually want to play all the games you have and the goal is not to just have a whole lot of shiny on the shelf but rather to actually play the games you have. Uh, to that end I have been spending the past few years slowly growing a collection and then constantly pulling back and trying to maintain a level collection. And today, our, um, today I'm giving over my tips on how I have learned to keep a somewhat trim collection. I say somewhat because I'm basically giving my best opinions and ideas of how not to go too crazy, but trust me when I say that I do not follow all of these as much as I would like to, and trust me when I say that I wish my collection were leaner than it is. So to start with, and these are my five tips, to start with number one is despise mediocrity. I mean this in the most I guess positive way possible, but learn to really despise a game that isn't good enough. I constantly say it, good isn't good enough, and you have to apply that to your collection. Your shelves can very quickly become completely overflowing with any number of good games, but there's only so much time you have to play games, and so you have to despise anything that isn't amazing. Uh, the games I wrestle with are, are, are the games that or in that middle zone. When I when I play a new game and I love it, I'm sold, I'm on board, I'm all in. Not a problem. When I play a new game and I don't like it, goodbye. Go, go ahead. I, I have no time or patience for you. Where I struggle is when a game is good, but not good enough. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a bar that I'm constantly raising. If I need a game to be here, and it's over here, then it's gone. But when it's over here is where I really struggle and have to challenge myself as to what to what to do next. So for example, something I've touched upon recently is Glenn Moore. Glenn Moore is a game that I enjoyed playing and I, I liked it, but I'm not quite sure I loved it. Uh, Kingdom Builder, which is over here, right there. That's a game that's been in my collection since the very beginning and I think it's slowly drifting towards the edge and it, it might fall off one time, one day soon. There are a lot of games and there are too many games. There are way too many games. You have to despise a game that doesn't make you yearn to play it. You have to, you have to you have to get it to the table and be like, this is why I own it. It has to be every time you play it should be an affirmation of how good the game is and why that game has earned a spot in your collection. And no, make no mistake, it has to earn that spot. So when you play a game and it was fun, when you play a game and it was totally fine, get rid of it. That's not a game that you need in your collection. That is a game that's taking up space. That's a game that's taking up time. That's a game that has a has a value. You can trade or sell it. Th those things are not things that you want. Learn to despise mediocrity and learn to seek perfection. This is a terrible, terrible idea in terms of your personal life, your marriage, your kids, or anything else really. But in terms of your board games, despise mediocrity, me mediocrity and seek perfection. Number two is evaluate not just your desire to play the game, but your realistic assessment of how likely you are to play a game. I have gotten rid of many, many games, or not acquired many, many games, that despite my desire to get them to the table, I understand that it is not realistic that I will get them to the table. And there are many examples. So, for example, just one offhand is Captain Sonar. Captain Sonar is a game that everything about it is appealing to me, and I really want to add it to my collection. But I recognize that getting eight people to the table who want to play that game is just not happening in my game group. So it doesn't matter how much I want to play it. If my goal, assuming my goal with my collection is to play the games and not just to collect them, then I have to evaluate how realistic I'm being. You can always get a game down the road. And for every, for every time that a game goes out of print and you'll have to pay a premium because you didn't get it way back, you'll save a lot more on the average. Sure, one game you'll have to pay a premium for, but the others will slowly get cheaper and cheaper over time as games tend to do. When a new game comes out, it 
costs, you know, it's popular. People want it. It costs the full amount. Over time, you'll find sales. Over time, you'll be able to get it cheaper. If you're patient, don't worry. Meaning, my point is, don't justify getting a game with, oh, well, I don't really have eight people in my game group today, but eventually I'll have eight people in my game group. Don't waste your time with that. And don't, don't self-justify with the fact that it might go to print later. As a whole, you will save money. Evaluate not just how much you want to play a game, but how realistic it is to get to the table. That means player count. That means will people in your game in your game group like that game. I mentioned Glenn Moore a few minutes ago. Glenn Moore is a game that I like, but the other main Euro players in my group, not all of them, but the main Euro players in my group were kind of on the fence about it. They 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 thought it was good, but not good enough. And since their decisions are a big part of what hits the table, if two of the main Euro gamers in my group are not interested in playing Glenmore, it is less realistic that Glenmore will get to the table. Not impossible, but less realistic. And that should be a factor when choosing a game. There are multiple party games. I recognize that I only have so much time that I get party games to the table. I have games like Just One, I have games like Monikers, I have like the, the, these amazing games, but I don't actually play party games that much. To have more than a handful of great party games is just a waste because I'll only ever play the best ones. You have to be realistic with what will hit the table and cut the things that won't. It doesn't matter how good it is if it's not seeing playtime. Reason number three is do the math. Just do the math. Figure out what you can realistically achieve and use that realism, use that that math as a driving point to seeing whether something, whether just how many games you can have. So what I mean by doing the math is, is pretty simple. Start by looking at how many games you have in, in your collection. So for instance, in my case, I have roughly in the range of 200 games in my collection, and that number constantly sent, manages to toe that line. Now, so let's take my top 20 games. In a perfect world, I would be playing my top 20 games multiple times per year. So like Blood Rage, for instance, I'd love to play Blood Rage five, six times a year. I'd love to play, uh, you know, Zomicide dozens of times per year. I'd love to play... Spirit Island, five, six times per year. Now, how many times a year am I actually playing one of these heavy games? I play a lot of games. Like, I am on the higher end, I have to imagine. Uh, I played I played something like 700 games in 2019, and that's a lot. But in terms of the big games, in terms of if you ignore the 10 plays of Codenames Duet, and you only count longer games, I'm not getting 700 longer plays to the table, I'd have to pull some stats, but it's probably closer to the range of maybe 150, 200, and even 150. 150 is three big games a week, three heavy games like Blood Rage, three heavy games like, uh, like what do we have on my shelf? We have three heavy games like Through the Ages or uh, Carcassonne. Well, Carcassonne's not really so heavy, but I'd have to look at my collection, but you get the idea. I mean, if you're picking the big games, the ones that take a long time to play, and you're playing three a week, that's only 150 of those games that you can really count. How many games do you actually have that want that place that play slot? How many games are coveting that same amount of time that you have? And at what point do you acknowledge that you're just not going to be playing the games that you have? So with me at 200, there are still games. I have Chaos in the Old World on my shelf. I haven't played that game in four years, and it's incredible. Now. I believe it will get to the table. It's just a question of the right circumstances, but that goes back to point two, be realistic. And I've gotten rid of many games that I believe would not hit the table, versus Chaos I think will, and I hope will. But you have to do the math on these things. How many games of Mage Knight can you play? How many games of Too Many Bones? How many, pick a game, pick the number of games, and figure out what is a realistic assessment, and then double that if you want. Meaning, Meaning, if you think you can only get a hundred games worth fine go to 200 give yourself the leeway to justify that you're not making any big mistakes or whatever you want to do to to keep more games i'm fine with that but at a certain point you go from being an optimist to lying to yourself there's a there's a difference you can say well i re I'll realistically i'm going to hit this number so if i'm if i have a great year if i have all the sundays and the extra time and i really want to pad for this that and the other fine pad your list be my guest but at a certain point, you're just lying to yourself. Get rid of the games you need to to get that number down to a, to a reasonable number. Once you do the math, once you see how many games you actually can hit the table, and then once you double that to give yourself all the room in the world, at a certain point, you have to acknowledge that you are collecting and not playing, and then you have to make the hard decisions. 
Tip number four is have a tip to monetize those games. It is much, much, and this, by the way, this is very self-serving. Uh, that goes back to we're Board Game Co. All we do is buy, you know, well, all we do, we sell games, but we, we trade games, we buy games. So this is very, very self-serving when I give you this advice. But find a way to turn your, your games into something else. It is much harder to let go, let's pretend you have a collection of 500 games. And let's pretend you've decided, with the, once you've done the math, you wanna get down to 200. Well, nobody wants to throw out 300 games. Any decision you make about how to keep a lean collection is going to be harder and harder if you don't have a way to turn your games that you're not playing, the games you're not keeping, if you don't have a way to turn them into something that serves you, then it just feels like you're throwing things out and that's gonna make the decision even harder. Uh, throwing out garbage bags full of junk is easy. Throwing out garbage bags full of board games hopefully hurts. So don't do that. Find a way to turn your other games into something else. That 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 method could be eBay, it could be Board Game Geek Marketplace, it could be trading at your local swap, whatever it is. It could be giving them to fa friends and family, or it could be selling them to Board Game Co., trading with Board Game Co. Whatever that, that method is, and whether or not it involves us, find a way to monetize your collection, or at least the games you're not playing. It, once you realize that you can turn 300 games that are just taking up shelf space into a few hundred games that you actually might want to try, that you might want to cycle through, it makes that process a lot easier. It takes the pain, it takes the bite out of keeping a lean collection. Uh, dropping in titles is hard. Dropping in titles because you're using it to fuel your, your hobby, to fuel your addiction, the good addiction of course, then it makes it significantly easier. So yes, find a way to turn it into something else so that's not just a question of getting rid of things but rather recycling things. And finally tip number five is just start. This isn't some hippie solution of well just get going but rather when I say just start what I mean is if you haven't tried this already give it a shot. If you haven't tried getting rid of games you're not playing give it a shot. Pick, pick five games out of the least likely that you hit the table, the ones that you care the least about and then go ahead and trade those or sell those. Pick the next five, see what happens. I have been doing this now, I have been turning, I have been trading games, uh, even before, long before I started Board Game Co. I have been trading games since, since about a year after I got into the hobby, so since 2013. It is incredibly rare the amount of times I have regretted getting rid of a game and wanted, wanted it back. And when I did, sometimes I did, and there's nothing wrong with getting a game back. There's nothing wrong with having second thoughts and thinking, you know what, I really, I really did want that game after all. When I do get those games back, it is even rarer that I find that I keep them. Usually I, I get the game back and I'm like, yes, I'm glad I got back Game X, Role Player. Role Player is a game I got back recently. I, I played it, thought it was okay, traded it, got it back, played it, was like, this was a good game. Played it again. This, this is a pretty good game. I don't know why I got rid of it. Then I got rid of it again. It is incredibly rare that I actually get a game back and then keep that game. There are, I'm not sure if anything really counts as being in that zone. Um, Istanbul is one that I've gotten back, but I've only played it once since I've gotten it back. I'm not quite sure it's safe just yet. In fact, it's on my potential cut list, which I do have a potential cut list at all times. Now, there's always a list of games that I believe really should be going, and I just haven't gotten around to to pushing myself off that ledge. For all these tips, I'm not perfect at this uh, by any means. Uh, there, there are, there's Orleon. Orleon is a game that I also, I trade, I tr got it, I got it back, I traded it, I got it back, but I haven't played it since I got it back. I've done this a lot and it's very, very rare to the point that I'm not sure if I can think of any exceptions. I guess the exceptions to me are the ones that I didn't play. So for instance, Mage Knight is a game I traded multiple times and then got it back multiple times before it finally hit the table. Cosmic Encounter was a game that I traded multiple times before it finally hit the table. So it does happen that a game I'll get rid of because I haven't got to the table, and those sometimes I'll get back and actually play. And that goes more to point two, of evaluating your desire to play versus being realistic. I got Cosmic Encounter back because I acquired a game group, but I had traded it away because at the time I was only playing two player games and it just wasn't hitting the table. So Mage Knight, I think Mage Knight was just more of a, the rule book I couldn't get through. And eventually, and eventually, because of how popular it is and because of how well acknowledged it is, I eventually powered through the rule book, but it took multiple times of it going back and forth. But yeah, so when I say just start, I'm not saying it as, oh, you know, just get moving. I'm saying that you will find it's easier than you thought it was. It is, e it is hard to say goodbye, but once you do, it's 
at least speaking for myself, it's a weight off my chest. It's not, I don't, I rarely ever trade a game and think I really, really miss that, I want it back. Rather, I trade a game and I'm like, it's gone. It's gone, I can move on, I can reserve my shelf space for something else. I can reserve my mental energy. I can reserve my game time. Because all those things are valuable. Shelf space is the easiest one to get rid of. If you have, you know, get a, get a storage shed in your, back, shed in your backyard. Uh, negotiate with your wife to get more laundry room space for shelves. You can always find more shelf space. But it is a factor, but it's not something that can't be overcome. But the mental space of having all those rules in your head, assuming you actually do, the mental space of knowing that you can only play so many games and each time you play one game you're inherently choosing to prioritize that time for this game over that game when i play istanbul when i play role player i'm not just choosing to play istanbul a role player i'm also choosing not to play title x whatever title x might be and those those evaluations, I mean, we all play these games, we all play Euros, we all self-optimize. If we're going to self-optimize in a game, why can't we self-optimize in our real life? And this is true for all your free time. Any free time you spend on anything is prioritizing one thing over another. Optimize your life, optimize your collection. So once again, just a quick recap. recap. Tip number one, despise mediocrity, mediocr mediocrity, yeah, getting tired. Despise mediocrity, seek perfection. Only keep the best board games. Good isn't good enough. Number two, evaluate not just your desire to play, but the realisticness of whether that game will hit the table and cut the ones that won't hit the table. It's sad. You can always get them back later when circumstances have changed, you can get them. Number three, do the math. As soon as you actually realize just how much you're lying to yourself, it makes it easier to cut those numbers down. As long as you think to yourself, well, I'm playing this all. It's just, it's just a growing collection. Then you're lying to yourself. Uh, it, once you do the math, once you see what you actually do have time for, it'll make it easier to get rid of some. Not everything, but some. And again, be optimistic on those numbers, by all means. Just don't don't be crazy. Be optimistic. Number four, have a way to, to turn those games you're getting rid of into something that serves your collection further. Trade them in, sell them in, come to us, we'll help you out. It, it, it makes it a lot easier if you have something to do with it. And finally, five, just start get moving, see if the process hurts. If you trade away, the, if you pick, pick five games in your collection, pick 10 games in your collection that are the least emotionally, the, 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 that you care about the least, that you can most easily say goodbye to. And if then get rid of them. Sell them, trade them, gift them, whatever you need to do, get rid of them. If you feel a, a breath, of, if, you see a, if you feel a relief getting rid of them, then for sure you know you're on the right track and keep doing it. If you feel pain and sadness and suffering, fine, I'm wrong, keep collecting, go ahead, you do you. Ultimately, this is all about happiness. I mean, this entire hobby of ours is about happiness. If collecting games makes you happy, that's fine. This video isn't here to convince you not to collect. This video is here for, for anyone who wants to keep a lean collection and is having trouble doing so. If your goal is to, to get rid of your games, to call your collection because you understand that you're not playing everything, then this video is meant to help you. If you want to collect, well, I mean, come to BoardGameCo.com. We have lots of hard-to-find games, and you probably need a few hundred more games, and we'd love to help you out with that, too. Ultimately, I'm Alex Radcliffe. This video is brought to you by BoardGameCo. Uh, very much in line with this video, BoardGameCo can help you sell games. It can help you trade games. And if you really insist on collecting, you, we can help you buy lots of games very affordably so. Uh, visit us at BoardGameCo.com. You can buy, sell, trade with us there. We'll always be happy to help you out. Other than that, you can like this video down below. You can subscribe. Uh, ring the bell for notifications so you can see our next videos. And watch another video or whatnot. Until then, we'll see you next time and have a good one.